Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus, that as you have received instructions from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honour, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles, who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all these offences, as we also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who gives us or gives you his Holy Spirit. About brotherly love, you don't need me to write you, because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do this even more, to seek to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work your own hands as we commanded you so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. But this is the word of the Lord. Before we get into the passage, I actually have a warning to, to give um, because as you can tell, the passage is, um, has, 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 has content about being sexually pure, sexually immorali- sexual immorality and by very nature, I just wanted to let you know, if you've got parents, like with young kids, um, you're warned. <laughs> My kids are here, and they're age seven to, to kind of ten. So, um, so anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it has the power to um, convict, has the power to save, has the power to encourage and to grow us. And Lord, as we read this, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have open eyes, open ears, and open hearts to be transformed by your word, your, your word to the glory of your name. In your name, amen. So tonight, I actually want to ask, start by um, asking you a question. Have you ever asked God what his will for a situation or for your life is? I'll go first and last. <laughs> you guys don't get a yes, that's right. Um, when I was a young Christian, fresh out of the gates, I was also at that stage in my life when I had just finished school and I was feeling the pressure to do something with my life. See, I didn't finish school with a clear plan or direction. I was just glad to have finished. So, as a young immature Christian, I decided to dedicate a whole year to seeking God's will for my life. And looking back, I cringe. I think is what I was really trying to do was to avoid some big questions and not to have some conversations that I really need to have. Because I'm going to level with you. I spent far more time Far, far, much, far more time telling people that I was dedicating the year to seeking God's will than I spent on my knees talking to God about it. Look, I had a great year. I was young. I had energy, hair, and time, all of which I lack now. And I'm sure that I spent some time asking God for guidance and direction. But a whole year? See... I made the mistake of thinking that God's will for my life was the same thing as working out what to do with my life. Like God's will was some kind of mystery. I needed a whole year to work it out. And I wish someone had come alongside and said, son, you don't need a whole year to work out God's will for your life. I can tell you right now. God's will is your sanctification. It's right there in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. He wants you to grow up in maturity in Christ. He wants you to imitate him. God's will is not a mystery. He wants you to be a people. He wants us to be a people that's marked with holiness and with love, which is why the main point tonight is that God's will is our sanctification. 
And we're going to break this section up, this passage up into two main sections. Um, sanctification that leads to purity, verses 1 to 8, sanct- and sanctification that leads to loving one another, verses 9 to 12. Now, as you can see, as we look at these two sections, we're going to see that there is a praise or encouragement, some instruction, and some reasons why we should do this. Um, but because we're going to be using the word sanctification a lot tonight, let's start by defining it. Sanctification in its simplest form, is the process of becoming more like Christ. See, the Greek word for sanctification or holiness, same word, is literally talking about the separating or divorce that needs to happen between our sinful ways, we could call this your old self, and marrying yourself to Christ. And here's an example in teachings. And this is your new self, our new creation. I also want to emphasize that our sanctification, it flows out of our justification. See, we're not saved by the way we live or how well we obey or keep his law. We're saved by faith through grace. Jesus and only Jesus can save us eternally. But, and that's good news, and that's the good news of the gospel, not by our doing, but Christ in us. But he also wants us to save us from the bondage and destruction that sin causes, which is why we are called to holiness. His love calls us to live set apart. So, as we start with sanctification that leads to purity, let's read verses 1 to 2. Now, I haven't got the passages up on the screen. You'll have to do it the old-fashioned way and use those books in front of you. Um, they're good. <laughs> So let's take a look at the encouragement that um, Paul has for the Thessalonians and for us. It says this, Additionally, then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. See, the additionally then, brothers and sisters, marks this shift in the book of Thessalonians, where Paul moves on from talking about um, his ministry with them and onto some instructions, some exaltation for his brothers and sisters. And although Paul is going to be instructing them in the coming verses, the tone is not one of rebuke, but rather encouragement. See, he wants to encourage them because he's encouraged. Pastor Paul has heard the report from his trusted brother, Timothy, and they they have listened, obeyed, and are living in a way that reflects Christ. That's great, he says. Keep it up. As you are doing, do this even more. See, Paul came to the Thessalonians with the good news that Jesus has come come and died to redeem their lives. This good news not only transformed their relationship with God, who has adopted them into his family, but but also it has transformed the way that they live. And as young Christians, Pastor Paul wants to encourage them to continue to walk in light of the gospel that he had brought them. Brothers and sisters, we too need encouragement at times, don't we? I'm sure you can think of times in your life when someone has just come alongside you at the right moment, the right time to encourage you. They know that you know Christ, that you are saved by his sacrifice. But sometimes living in holiness, it can, you can get us cut off and cut out. It can be hard. And in those situations, what a joy it is to have people around you that can tell you, just keep swimming. Just keep reflecting on the truths that are found in the Bible. See, the gospel has set you free. And until he comes, stand stand firm in your faith. So I want to encourage you also not to neglect the reading and studying and memorizing of God's word. Let it fill you to the fullest. Let it encourage you when you need encouragement. And let it convict you when you need correction. Let it sanctify you as you yield to the Spirit's leading. Which brings us to the instruction found in verses 1 through 5. 
Did you drink out of one of these? Yours is worse. Thanks, man. <laughs> Not that I really care, but... <laughs> it says this. <clears throat> Verses 3, um, we're looking at. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honour, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. Now, i got to be honest, verse 3, it hits me like a road train every time I read it. This is God's will, your sanctification. It's such a beautiful and simple command. As I mentioned earlier, God's will is not a mystery. He wants us to be a people that are marked with holiness and love. And although this command is specifically um, directed to your sanctification towards purity, generally this command, um, this command for holiness is for all areas of our lives. That means in the workplace we should be set apart. At school or uni, we should be set apart. When watching the State of Origin this week, we should be a people that are marked by holiness. At the gym, on the roads at the beach, in the shops, and this is a big one now, our Netflix, YouTube, internet viewing and socials should all be marked by holiness. Every single area of our lives should be marked by holiness and love. And here's why. Because your identity in Christ, who lives and dwells in you through his spirit. See, these bodies are his temple. And we are called to live in a way that reflects him. But the context of this passage is our sanctification that leads to purity. He tells them to keep away from sexual immorality. That they should control their own bodies in holiness, not with lustful passions, because you're not like the Gentiles. You are a holy people set apart by the blood of Christ. His instruction here still doesn't really feel like rebuke. I mean, we've, we've heard in other letters that Paul's written when he's rebuking them, like the Galatians, where at the beginning he pretty much tells them, hey, I'm an apostle, and you guys are foolish. This has a different tone. However, I wonder if Paul was to, if Paul was to write this letter to uh, the church in Australia or Brisbane and address the issue of sexual immorality if we would hear rebuke or encouragement. See, the first century Greco-Roman culture was incredibly sexualized. Adultery was normalized. People would go to the temple and they would worship sex. Same-sex sexual activity was common and marriage was, it was barely a commitment. Does that sound familiar? 2,000 years later, in the era of technology and science, society is redefining marriage gender, relationships, and we too go to the altar, don't we, as a culture, and worship sex. We just do it on screens in the privacy of our own home. I think the instruction to keep away from sexual immorality found in verse 3 is one that we as a church need to be reminded of constantly. Because there are people sitting here today that are embracing sexual sin because they don't think that anyone will find out. So, let's start by defining what sexual purity looks like. And then we're going to spend some time looking at what this might look like for singles, for those who are married, and for parents. All right, sexual purity is sexual activity in the confines of marriage between a biological man, we have to say biological now, and a biological woman to the exclusion of any other option the world has thought up. And they've thought some stuff up. Let me just say, for clarity, this is in action but also in thought. Anything that falls outside of that is immorality. Now, let me address these three different groups in light of the passage, which tells us to have self-control in verse 4 and not be like the Gentiles who indulge in lustful passions in verse 5. Firstly, the single. So I think when we're young, we have this tendency to think that having a wife 
or a husband will solve our sexual sin issues. And I want to say right now and very clearly, it does not. If you are single and struggle with sexual sin, a husband or a wife will not fix your immorality. That sexual immorality has the power to absolutely destroy your marriage if you don't deal with it beforehand. I've seen it happen with friends. So your spouse will feel betrayed, hurt, unloved, violated, and abused. So if you're single, deal with your immorality before it destroys your relationships. Verse 4 calls you to have self-control over your body. And I want to encourage you that the best way to love those around you, and particularly your future spouse, is by not letting anything get in the way of you being sexually pure right now. Look, this is real for me. I have three beautiful daughters. I also have a son. But I have three beautiful daughters, so you could say that I've got skin in the game. I don't want them to experience the hurt of their future husband caught lying and cheating on them through a screen or worse. Love your future spouse, friends. Love them by dealing with your sexual sin. So if you need safeguards on your devices, if you need accountability, then do it. Don't let your pride, your reputation, shame, or consequences get in the way of your sanctification. Now, the other thing I want to address with the singles is dating. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to give you my thoughts on dating, as this is not what the passage is about, thank goodness. But I do want to address what purity looks like within the dating and engagement realm. So to be clear, sexual purity is sexual activity between a man and woman who are married. So if you're engaged or dating, sexual activity is not an option. However, the question that often gets asked is, how far can I go? I know you asked the question because as a young Christian who was dating, I asked the same question. And the answer is not very far. But it's the wrong question. We should always be asking, how can I be more pure and sanctified in this relationship? See, I have not yet met a married Christian couple who regret not being more sexually active when they were dating. However, I have talked to several people that have regrets and confessed sins about how far they went when dating, when in the dating relationship. Singles, less is more in this situation. See, this period in the relationship is to work out if you should be married. And sex and any form of sexual activity will cloud your judgment. So I want to encourage you to maintain your objectivity by abstaining from sexual activity. Hopefully that is enough of a rhyme to stick in your head. I want you to encourage you to maintain your objectivity, objectivity by abstaining from sexual activity. But here's a bit of a practical guide because I know it's helpful. If you're willing to do the act, watch the movie or follow the account in a church setting in front of your elders, then it's probably okay to do or look at. If you need to close a door or would rather no one see what you're up to, then you just shouldn't be doing it. Verse 5 instructs us not to have these lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. See, lust is more about you and your desires. What can I get out of this? Lust is selfish. This is what marks an unbeliever. In contrast, love, which Christians are marked by, is selfless, outward, sacrificial. It's disciplined, humble, and ultimately it is God-glorifying. All right. To those who are married... Guard yourselves and protect the beauty of marriage. See, marriage, when conducted the way that God intended it to be conducted, 
is a beautiful picture of our relationship with Christ. It should be a constant reminder that we are united to Christ and all the benefits that come with being part of his kingdom. So you too should be people that have self-control over your own bodies, in verse 4. And you shouldn't be like the Gentiles who, who don't know God with their lustful passions, verse 5. Those who are married, guard your eyes. Keep one another accountable. Don't watch things that violate the purity of your marriage. Don't follow things that cause you to stumble. Don't read things that bring unrealistic emotions, desires, and fantasies into your relationship. And finally, the marriage bed is for you and your spouse. Don't bring anything or anyone else into it. When you watch porn, racy TV shows, or movies, or when your social feeds are flooded with images that pull you away from your spouse, you'll bring those images and those thoughts into the marriage bed and destroy it. These things are lustful passions, and they are selfish and destroy the mutual love and respect that God intended and designed your marriage to be. Now, remember our definition of sexual purity. If you are married and you're a man and a woman, then you should be enjoying sexual activity. Because sex is a gift that is designed by God to bring a husband and a wife into a closer and more intimate relationship than any other relationship here on, here on earth. That means that you shouldn't be using sex as a tool to get what you want out of the relationship. For example, rewarding your spouse for cleaning up like some kind of carrot. See, Christian marriage is not like a greyhound running around a track chasing its reward. It's not like a prostitute who, for a price, will reward or commit sex and, and commit sexual activity. Christian marriage is an echo of the relationship that we have in Christ, where the pleasure and joy of grace is given freely and without strings. So keep away from sexual immorality. Let your marriage be one of mutual respect, humility, and love. To the parents, we're getting there. I was shocked, really shocked, to learn that the average age teachers are seeing kids be exposed to sexual content on their screens is seven. That's all my kids. All my kids are above seven. And I really wish they were wrong. I hope they're wrong. But this also shocked me. It is thought that most 15-year-old boys, and the girls aren't too far behind, have been exposed to violent, degrading, and explicit sexual content on either their screen or a friend's screen. This means that both male and females are taking violence into the bedroom and believing that it is normal. But I believe we need to hear it. I believe we need to hear it because this is the world our kids are growing up in. We have a responsibility to shape what purity looks like and inform them of the devastating effects immorality has on their future relationships and their relationship with God. And these conversations, that's plural, multiple conversations with your kids, they need to start young. See, you might think that you have great control over your kids' screens, which is necessary and essential, but let me tell you, evil is out there, and you will not and cannot protect them forever. It's your job as a loving parent to prepare them for the world that they are going into and not simply shelter them from it. And I want to be clear, shelter them. Do everything you can to shelter them and protect them. But they also need the tools to deal with the reality of this world. Brothers and sisters, we live in an increasingly sexualized culture and I don't know where it stops. But we are called, within that culture, within that society, to live lives that are holy when the world around us is saturated in sin. We are called to be sanctified. But that sanctification, it flows out of our status in Christ as justified. So let's continue with verses 6 to 8. 
We're, we're given some reasons to live this way. It says this in verse 6. This means that one must not transgress, take, uh, transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner because the Lord is an avenger of these offences, as we also previously told you and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, we're given four reasons here um, in the text why we are to be sexually pure. And 6a, it says this, because um, there are, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So love them with a Christ-like love, with, uh, with, with, um, not with lustful and undisciplined passions like the Gentiles. Just a little note, like with the, the, the singles in the room, when you're dating as well, that's a brother and sister in Christ first, right? You don't know if you're going to be married until you walk down that aisle, the ring, the kiss, everything's happened, that's when you're married. Not any time, any moment before that. So don't treat that person like you are married until you are married, okay? Okay? They're your brother and sister. Okay. 6b, that's where I was. So verse 6b, because Jesus is an avenger of these offences. This, this idea, this idea of avenger is an Old Testament concept. Um, it's the idea that Jesus will take care of these things or these people when he comes. So, brothers and sisters, until he comes, he knows and he sees all things. He knows your motives, he knows your thoughts, he knows your actions. Verse 7, the the third reason, because we are called to holiness, not impurity. And uh, Ephesians 5, 1 to 3 helps us see this when it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved and gave himself for us as a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. The sexual immorality and impurity or greed should not even be heard, not even be heard among you as is proper for saints. Friends, we are called to be a people that are marked by holiness and love, not impurity and immorality. And finally, verse 8. When we live in immorality, we reject God. This is heavy, right? See, the reality is that often you know what sin is. You know before you click on that website. You know which accounts are impure you know that that TV show is not glorifying before you watch it. The Bible is clear. And the warning here is that when you watch, read, and act in sexual immorality, you are rejecting God. Because you are rejecting the spirit that convicts and guides you towards holiness. Now, I was once asked what it was like having twins. I've got twin, a seven-year-old now, seven years old now. Um, But when I was asked the question, I was um, in the heat of um, changing nappies and sleepless nights and burping and vomiting and burping and vomiting and changing nappies and no sleep. And I said, it was like you're in the middle of the ocean and you're drowning and a rescue boat comes out and instead of giving you a life craft, they give you a baby to look after. (laughs) And then they take off. It was a dark time, and I'm an optimist. (laughs) I'm generally an optimist, but it was a dark time. They're older now, and it's much easier. Different issues. Um, (laughs) Look, you might be feeling similar right now. You might be thinking, I feel horrible. I feel convicted. And I get it, because this is a convicting passage. But let me point out some hope before we move on to our second point. 
I want you to imagine if this was all on you, right? That all this stuff was all on you. You had no help, no guidance, no light to cling to in those dark places. Where God, see, this is a bad place. That's a bad place to be in, a place where God isn't. A place where God doesn't care, where God is indifferent to your sin. That place is hellish. We can rejoice in knowing that God is with us, helping us, guiding us, and convicting us, and encouraging us. See, if you feel convicted, then that's evidence of God in you. That's great news, brothers and sisters. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now, as we know, sanctification is not limited only to leading us to be sexually pure. God's will is that we be sanctified in all aspects of our lives. And Jesus taught us this in John 13, 34, 35. Rob read it out last week. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's our second point. Sanctification that leads to loving one another. So let's first look at the encouragement Pastor Paul has for the Thessalonians, starting in verse 9. It says this, About brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you're doing this towards all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, do this even more more. So the Thessalonians seem to be on point in this area for the most part. And once again, this is not rebuke, but encouragement. He's telling them, do what you are doing even more. You're doing good. And I too, I'm encouraged when I see a need come up in the church and that need met by a loving brother or sister. I think of the meals people give, the loving and encouraging conversations that happen, the auction today, dinner tonight, the way so many of you serve faithfully and consistently in the church. And this is the kind of love that should be evident in our church. The love we have for one another should be a reflection, an echo of the love that's found in the gospel. It should be sacrificial, intentional, humble, should be full of mercy and grace. God's spirit should be evident in us. And the fruits of those spirit in Galatians 5 should be evident in our church. So those that live in such a way, I want to encourage you, do so even more, as Paul says. But just as the Thessalonians were known for how they um, love one another, we too should be a church that loves one another with a Christ-like love. So I encourage you, right? Don't let your pride, your busyness, your ambitions, or your desires, your work, sport, or leisure get in the way of God sanctifying you, uh, God sanctifying work that leads to you loving one another more. See, as you go through the rhythms of your life, whether that be work, small kids, school, uni, ask the question, how can I love God and love one another the way that Christ loves me? Paul has some thoughts for his brothers and sisters on how this could be implemented in verse 11 as we look at his instruction. To seek a quiet life, he says in verse 11, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, as we commanded you. What's he saying here? Uh, If I was going to paraphrase this verse, I would say it would be something like, don't be lazy 
and don't sponge off your church family, which is why I'm not in translation. But it seems that some of the Thessalonian church were accustomed to not working and living off the charity of others in the church. This idea also comes out in Paul's second letter to them when he instructs them in chapter 3, don't be busybodies, to work quietly and to provide for themselves. As a parent, I'm torn between these two thoughts. I want to give my kids everything they need to succeed and flourish in life. But I also want to make sure that they are entitled and spoiled into being lazy people. Our similar thing is happening here. It's good to love one another by giving gifts and providing needs when the circumstance warrants it. Do that. Absolutely do that. But it's equally loving to love a fellow brother and sister by working hard, being wise with your money, and living within your means. So that you don't need to rely on those around you. See, we're not to view our brothers and sisters as a resource that allows us not to put the work in, to be lazy. They should have your back when things go pear-shaped, but that's the exception, not the rule. See, if you're sponging off your brother or sister in Christ, and that could be your parents, to support your gaming career that's going nowhere, then it's time to rethink your life choices. Friends, don't get in the way of God's sanctifying work by being lazy, selfish, prideful, and rather love one another by looking after yourself when you can. And here's why. Verse 12 gives us two reasons. It says, one, so that you may behave properly in the presence of outsiders, and two, not be dependent on anyone. Friends, the world is watching. How we act towards one another matters. Our witness matters. As a church, let's be known for how we love one another as the Thessalonians were. I often tell my kids that when they're frustrated with with their siblings, right, it happens regularly, and they're frustrated and they're, they're angry and they're, they're like just overcome with this kind of, this, these emotions, right? And I said, man, you, like, if you can't love your brother and sister, you're going to find it really hard once you get out there to love others, right? It's, we need to love our brothers and sisters in Christ because if we can't love each other, then we're not marked by love. Friends, In closing, it was over 20 years ago that I became a Christian. And I have struggled. I've struggled with sin every single day. See, there's this constant battle going on in my soul between the flesh and the truth. Look, there have been times of victory over my sin, and there have been times of failure. This is the reality of living in a sinful world. My prayer and my hope is that we grow up, as we heard in the James series, and mature in Christ. Don't let your failures define you. Don't let your shame burden you. Who you are is in Christ. And as a child of his kingdom, know that God, he he wants you to be holy because sin is devastating on your life. And he is and can save you you from the bondage of it. So brothers and sisters, keep striving towards holiness. And as the song we're about to sing says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has the power to pull us into line when we're wrong. We thank you that you give us 
your spirit to help us see truth, to help us to see Christ in our lives. And Father God, I pray that as we go into our, our, the, the business of our lives this week, Lord, you would continue to convict us when we need conviction, encourage us when we need encouragement, and sanctify us when we need sanctification. I pray these things in your precious name. Amen.